Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. The passage we'll talk about today is that long psalm that we chanted earlier in the service, Psalm 38. Dear friends in Christ, have you ever had the difficult task of having to go up to someone and confront them about something that's very wrong in their lives? Something that they really need to hear and confess because if they don't, their lives could be ruined. Last week, I watched a program called American Experience on PBS Channel 11. They had a documentary uh, on that station that premiered a two-night series on the presidency of Bill Clinton. And of course, all of us here know what the most difficult and awful time of President Clinton's uh, time in office was. Surely, he brought about his own difficulty, extreme difficulty, by his serious moral lapses with Monica Lewinsky. And just before the news about that situation was going to break into the national news, one of the president's closest personal advisors had to come up to him and tell them that this is going to be out all over the country and all over the world. So we had to tell him, all heck is going to break loose and look out. Now, as if that wasn't tough enough to hear, President Clinton, before that news hit, next had to go and finally come clean and tell the truth to his wife, Hillary. He had to confess to her not only what he had done, which was bad enough, but he also had to tell her that he had lied to her and that he had seriously betrayed her right to the core. What an awful, awful situation in every way. And regardless of what anybody thought of President Clinton, who would ever want to have been in his shoes at that time? How low he must have felt, and deservedly so, after severely hurting the one who loved him the most, the one who loved him and had just stood up for him and was telling people, no, none of this is true at all. So here, she stood up for him all the time when he had lied to her. Ironically, the day after confessing to Hillary and the whole scandal did get out there on the national news, the president and his family flew off to Martha's Vineyard for a vacation. And from all reports, as we can only imagine, it was the vacation from hell, especially for the president. It's bad enough to have to confess your sin, but who of us could imagine at all how awful it is to have the most horrific act you have ever been guilty of paraded across television screens not only in the United States, but all over the world. How low can you go? Where can you hide from your own personally induced free fall into oblivion that caused such horrible, undeserved pain for the people that he loved and who loved him the most? Again, none of us would have ever wanted to be in President Clinton's shoes at that point. But as we look at our own lives, we're not public figures. Also, none of us is guilt-free in our own lives. And while we may not have committed such an awfully publicly known sin as the president, again, we all have sinned. And close your eyes for just a moment and think back to that sin in your own life, 
that case of bad judgment, that lapse of moral character that in your heart of hearts you know was the worst moment in your life. If you take the time to think about what that is, we all probably would admit we don't like to think of that thing, that thing that we did, that event in our life. Nobody likes to think of those things. No, nobody wants to dwell on our worst moments that we struggle to actually erase from our memories. We don't want anybody else bringing them up. So I mentioned at the beginning of the service, today is the third Wednesday in Lent. We're in the third week of the midweek Lenten series, focusing on penitential psalms in the Bible. And today's penitential psalm probably isn't one of the best known, but it's very thorough. It's psalm 38, a psalm of King David, where he is confessing his sin before God. And really, as we read that, as we sang that, it's a pretty tough passage. Um, of the 22 verses of this psalm, about 20 of them have King David agonizing over what he knew was a horrific sin that he had committed in his past. And if you take a look at that again, David is almost inconsolably guilty. And he's literally feeling the wrath of God in his flesh that he takes as the punishment for what he's done. Now, in the psalm, David does not mention what the particular sin was that was causing him to be so tormented, so terribly tortured in his guilt. But as we look at David's life in the scriptures, we all know, at least from the scriptures, we don't know every detail of his life, but from the Bible, we certainly know what was David's worst downfall. And of course, it bore some similarity to that of President Clinton. Only in David's case, it was actually exponentially worse. And we know that that was his adulterous involvement with Bathsheba, who happened to be the wife of David's supremely loyal soldier, Uriah. Surely we all know the story pretty well. Namely, that while this loyal soldier, Uriah, was away fighting for the king, David had a fling with Uriah's wife. And in the process, Bathsheba became pregnant. Really, the whole account reads like a modern-day soap opera. But tragically, this isn't fiction, but this was excruciatingly true for David and everyone at that time. When David discovered that Bathsheba was pregnant, he immediately called Uriah home from the battlefield, and David tried to set up a scenario by which Uriah would think that he was the father of this child that Bathsheba had conceived. But out of commendable loyalty to his fellow soldiers who were still on the battlefield fighting, Uriah refused to go home to his wife, even though King David set up not one, but two golden opportunities for him. So when David's setups failed and failed utterly because Uriah was too good a man, David took the next step toward the unspeakably despicable when he sent Uriah right back to the battlefield with specific orders that Uriah be put right into the front lines knowing full well that Uriah would certainly be killed there, and so he was. Now, in the eyes of the world, David was actually free to marry Bathsheba, and she could have his child with no human being being the wiser at all. What a disgusting but 
seemingly foolproof plan for David. The only problem was that, unfortunately for David, God knew of his murderous treachery down to the most minute detail, and of course, God was not going to let David off the hook. So, God sent the prophet Nathan to speak to David in the form of a parable to ultimately let David know that God knew everything that had occurred. So Nathan told David this parable of two men in a town, one a rich man and the other a poor man. And the rich man had everything he possibly could have wanted, but the poor man and his family had nothing, nothing save for one little ewe lamb that was very special to this poor man and his family. Well, one day a visitor came into town to visit the rich man, causing the rich man to have to provide the visitor with a meal. But the rich man chose not to take a lamb from his own huge flock for the meal, but he went and he took that one little ewe lamb from the poor man and had that prepared for his guest dinner, leaving the poor man and his family with literally nothing at all. Now, when David heard the story, naturally, he burned with anger, as the passage says in the scriptures, and he had righteous indignation against the rich man, saying that he deserved to die for this terrible thing that he had done. And then Nathan zinged David with the total condemnation of God's divine punchline when he said, you are the man. You, David, are the guilty one. You are the one deserving death. And of course, in that moment, David knew what the parable was really out about. He knew that his horrible, shameful sin and his totally deserved guilt had been exposed. With that in mind, hear again the words from tonight, today's psalm, Psalm 38. David speaking here those words that we sung earlier. O Lord, rebuke me not in your anger, nor discipline me in your wrath, for your arrows have sunk into me. Your hand has come down on me. For my iniquities have gone over my head like a heavy burden. They're too heavy for me. I groan because of the tumult of my heart. O Lord, all my longing is before you. My sighing is not hidden from you. My heart throbs. My strength fails me. And the light of my eyes, it also has gone from me. My friends and companions stand aloof from my plague. And my nearest kin stands far off. Has David been decimated by what he has done to himself? Surely the answer to that is yes. David was crushed to the ground by his guilt. Without a doubt he was. And then Psalm 38 wraps up with David's plea to the Lord for mercy, where David says, I am ready to fall. My pain is ever before me. I confess my iniquity. I am sorry for my sin. Do not forsake me, O Lord. O my God, be not far from me. Make haste to help me, O Lord, my salvation. So David clearly, finally gets it, and he sincerely confessed to the Lord, and he begged and begged and groveled for forgiveness. Now, Let's think of ourselves and think of those times when we know in our heart of hearts that we are rightfully guilty. As Christians, we can and we should truly, deeply, and honestly confess our sins, especially those sins that we would otherwise just love to bury as far out of our own sight and everybody else's sight as is humanly possible. 
believe it or not, we have a huge advantage over King David. Because even though King David is one of the greatest human figures in the Bible, he lived on the other side of the cross. He lived before Jesus came and suffered and died on that cross. So he certainly knew about the promise of the coming Savior, but David didn't live to see him. And David didn't know in the kind of detail that you and I do of everything that Jesus accomplished for the forgiveness of our sins. David may have written himself the chilling words of Psalm 22 that described in minute detail a thousand years in advance the scene of Jesus' crucifixion. And go home and read Psalm 22. It is uncanny. So David wrote about that crucifixion scene from the soldiers dividing Jesus' clothing and casting lots for his clothing to the piercing of his hands and feet with the nails that pinned him to the cross and even to the exact words that the Lord spoke from his cross when he said, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? David wrote those words, surely not knowing fully what they meant, or at least not experiencing the fulfillment of them. We, on the other hand, are totally blessed indeed to know that Jesus, the Son of the living God, was truly, totally, and utterly forsaken by his Father when he hung on the cross. And why was it that Jesus was so utterly forsaken by the Father? It was because, as he hung on that cross, Jesus literally sucked out of David and out of you and me and every human being who has ever lived, who is alive now, and whoever will live. He has sucked out of each and every single one of us the guilt of every single sin we've ever committed. Even as we think in our heart of hearts about that worst thing that we have ever said or ever done, that thing that we don't even want to think about, Jesus has already taken away our guilt for that most awful thing long, long ago. He literally carried that guilt that we deserve. He literally took that punishment that we deserve. He carried it and all of our sins away from us and onto his own flesh as he hung on the cross. So in that terrible three-hour time, in that longest and darkest three-hour stretch in human history, Jesus, the Son of God, was the most sinful human being ever because he chose to take all of our sin on his own back and he carried it all the way to his death for you and for me. I love this banner here. I love that banner because it says it all. What wondrous love. What wondrous love is this? What wondrous love don't you and I need every time it is that the guilt we otherwise rightly deserve is weighing us down. We are indescribably blessed to live on this side of the cross so that we know without question that every single sin of ours, even the worst, already died 2,000 years ago when Jesus died on the cross. Our sin and guilt went with the Lord into his tomb. And then, just like the cloth wrappings that Jesus left behind when he rose from the dead, so our sins are left behind in that tomb, buried forever, never again to see the light of day. So what David longed for with all his heart uh, as promise on his side of the cross, we know as blessed reality forever 
on our side of the cross. That's why we can say with St. Paul's, those words that are so chock full of meaning from Romans chapter 8, where he writes, There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship, famine, nakedness, danger, or sword? Knowing all these things, we are more than conquerors through Christ who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future nor any powers, neither height nor depth nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is ours in Christ Jesus our Lord. So as we think of terrible sins and unspeakable moral failures like those of President Clinton, King David, and especially as we think of our own worst sins and failures, we know and know for certain that as we put our trust in Jesus, our guilt is already long gone, and we are totally forgiven by our Father who cares for each of us always as his deeply beloved children. Amen. Now the peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen.